Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second portion of two of questions and answers. I'm still Amjad Muhammad. I didn't change my name during the short interval. I kind of got used to this name, so I might stick with it for a little bit longer. Uh, the number to call for your questions is 01274 214 2199. You know, it says the number to call. It would be, I guess, the number to dial because if you sat in your front room and said, oh, 01274, 214, 299, nothing would happen, actually. Uh, unless, obviously, you had a uh, uh, a uh, iPhone and that picked up uh, or uh, your, uh, the chap, is it, Mr. Siri, picks up your voice and dials it for you. Uh, look how lazy life is becoming, isn't it? Now we're not even going to stand up and dial a number. And we say dial a number, it's not dial anymore, isn't it? That was in the old days. You know when you used to have that phone and you used to kind of like spin it all the way around for the dial and if you left your finger in it, it kind of like pull your finger all the way back. Then were the good old days. Eh? Now we don't dial a number, we kind of press the number in. So we should say press 01274 214 But maybe that's just too much specific information. That's the number to call for your questions. Get your questions in early. Uh, as you know, we've got what? Uh, about 20 minutes or so uh, before our second portion will be elapsed. Mm -hmm. And as you know, it goes very quickly. So please dial, press, whatever type of action you wish to do uh, in order to get your call across to me. In the meantime, I want to share some ahadith with you that I have been doing so far uh, when we get to this point, uh, which has been rare in the last sort of uh, a couple of months. And that is to share some ahadith with you. And the last time I think we did this was going back a few weeks when we spoke about the person who is a, an alim, as we described it. Nowadays, we feel that an alim, you know, is somebody who's done a course, a, like a seven, eight year course. And unfortunately, you're getting a lot more kind of watered down versions now, three years, four years, five years, part time, a few hours a day. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't have an issue with them as long as it produces quality students um, because at the end of the day, we've all got different lifestyles now. You know, we shouldn't have a certain type of student. Uh, we could do with all types of students, uh, people who may be married, people with children, people who've got a regular day job and things like that. So we don't miss out on quality people. Uh, but also what it does, unfortunately, it, it kind of brings down the quality and capacity and capability of that particular student in terms of being delivering to the community. Khair, that aside, uh, that's what we see as an alim. However, an alim is not just somebody who's done a six, seven, eight year course. Uh, yes, he's been through the kind of, uh, you know, jumped over the hurdles, jumped through the hoops, done whatever he needed to do to pass the exams at the end of each year and then eventually finish and graduate. But in reality, an alim is somebody who understands the sharia. That's what an alim truly is. Now, you might be thinking if somebody studies for seven years, you'd hope that they understand the sharia, but that's not always the case. There are people, for example, who've been to school up until the age of 16, and when you run into them at the age of 18, 19, they can no longer read and write. And yet they've you know, been studying since the age of four up to the age of 16. That's 12 years, and the key thing they'll be looking at is literacy and numeracy. There are people who you might run into after 16, 17, 18, 19 years old who struggle with basic maths. Okay, still pulling their fingers out when they're adding, you know, 15 add 24 or something and they've got to kind of use their fingers to work it out. Yet, yet they've been doing maths for 14 years. So it doesn't necessarily always mean just because you've done the course that you have certain qualities. You may at the time, but if you don't pursue that, if you don't practice it, a bit like you don't practice law or you don't practice classical Arabic or you don't practice a particular skill, you learn to become an electrician or you learn to become a, a carpenter and then you don't practice that skill and you leave it for a year, two years, three years, when you're coming back to it, you're going to struggle again. So a scholar is someone who kind of continues to practice that work. That's an alim. And the hadith describe him in very, very positive ways, okay? Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, I just remind you of the hadith in which he said, Fadlu al-alim al al-abid ka fadli ala adnakum. The excellence of a scholar over a worshipper is the excellence of me over the least of you. Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu wa ahla samawati wal ardina hatta namlata fi juhriha wa hatta al-hut la yusalluna ala muallim al-nas al-khayr. 
that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, he descends his mercy. The angels seek uh, dua for him, uh, seek repentance for him. To such an extent as even the ant in its ant hole. And not only that, so that's on the land, even the fish in the sea, they will continue to ask forgiveness for that person who teaches good to the people. That person who is a teacher. And the normal people, and muallim is a teacher. The people who teach good to the people are those who are the learned. They will always share good things. They will share good practices. They won't talk about doing bad things. They won't teach people to do bad things. They will teach people to do good. And then we share the other hadith as well. Amilun, uh, alimun, amilun, mu'allamun, yud'a kabiran fi malakuti samawati. So, and then in fact we had shared the other hadith. So let's move now to a new hadith, okay? Um, and this is the narration which comes in Al-Mu'ajam Al-Kabir. And the hadith is Hassan. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, is reported to have said, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, إنما العلم بالتعلم والفقه بالتفقه ومن يريد الله بخير يفقه في الدين وإنما يخشى يخشى الله من إباده العلماء. That all people, يا أيها الناس, إنما العلم knowledge only comes by learning. إنما العلم بالتعلم. Knowledge only comes through learning. You can learn. Through books, you can learn through a teacher. The thing about learning through books is you should be a capable scholar before you access books directly because the book is your teacher then. And because when you have questions, you can't ask the book the questions, you're going to get confused and you're going to fill in the gaps yourself. Similarly, if the author is uh, one that cannot be relied upon, then he could or she could take you down a, another path which is not good for you. So, all oh people, knowledge only comes by learning and understanding. Uh, sorry, and, well, 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 fiqh. And understanding only comes by tafaqqu, seeking understanding. For whom Allah SWT intends good, he gives him a good understanding of the religion. And then a verse is quoted uh, from Surah 35, ayat number 28. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهُ مِنْ إِبَادِهِ يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ إِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء That the ones who truly fear Allah are the learned people. Now that's common sense. Okay, why the ulama? The ulama, ilm, are those who know Allah. Now we cannot truly know Allah because our capacity of knowing is limited. We are created. Our brains, our create, our brains, our our brains, our created. Our brains are created. Our ability to understand is created. All matters associated with us are created. Therefore, the created does not have capacity to fully understand the creator. That's like this pen. Okay, that's like this pen. Trying to understand me. How is this pen going to understand me? How, what capacity does this pen have of knowing what I'm like? It doesn't. Similarly, this cup of coffee can't understand me. This cup of coffee was created, if I, you know, for the sake of using that word, made, created by somebody, a human. But the coffee, cup of coffee, cannot understand us. Uh, you know, the glasses, my famous glasses, was created by a man, a woman, a human, designed by a human. Okay, it might have been a machine that made it, but the machine was made by a human. How can my glasses understand me? They don't know anything about me. They don't know what I can and can't do. They don't even know what I am. It's beyond their capacity to even know what I am. You know, they don't know what thoughts are going through my head. What I want to do next, وغيرة. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us the best of creatures. Therefore, we have some capacity. He's given us aqal. Whereas these inanimate objects don't have aqal. They have some 
understanding, but we won't understand their understanding, if that makes sense. But they don't have aql to reason and rationalize. That's why we are considered as ahsan al khali You know, we are considered as rather, sorry, the best of, cre uh, the best of uh, creatures. We have capacity to understand Allah to the limit that he has taught us. We cannot understand him beyond what he has already taught us. We don't have that ability to do so. Okay? We don't have that ability to do so. So in that way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us. So who will truly fear Allah? You know when you see a baby and you see like a wild dog, the baby will just, toddler will just crawl up to this wild dog and just stroke it and he'll be thinking, oh my God, you know, what's this baby doing? That wild dog is going to bite his hand, it's going to bite his arm and it's going to scratch it or whatever. But there's no fear in the child. The reason why there's no fear in the child is because the child doesn't know what the dog is capable of doing. Similarly, fire. You know, a young toddler, when he sees fire, it looks like it's something exciting. So they want to touch the fire because it's bright, it's orange, it's moving. But we as an adult will think, oh my God, that child is going to, you know, touch that fire. Similarly, like, you know, near the top of the stairs, a child will just kind of run to the top of the stairs or crawl to the top of the stairs and you'll be thinking, that baby's going to fall, that baby's going to fall. It has no sense of fear. Reason why it has no sense of fear, because it cannot understand danger. It's only when a baby understands danger, as we get older, do we then start taking precautions. Then we know that, oh, if I do this, I, this could happen. If I do this, that, you know, we learn from experience. When we fall down the stairs a couple of times, we realize that falling down the stairs is quite uncomfortable. It's quite painful. When we burn our hand on something hot, we realize that touching hot things is painful. So we quickly learn. So we become mutal, yani ta'lim. We've learned either through experience or through education. We learn through books or through experience. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that the only true humans that fear Allah are those who know Him. Because when you know the capacity and the control that Allah has over your life, you know, when you're blissful, completely blissfully unaware, the control which Allah has over your life, you have no fear of Him. Why would you? Because you think Allah has no control over your life. You think you're making all the decisions. I'm going to decide to stand up, so you stand up. I'm going to decide to sit down, so you sit down. I'm going to decide to do this, so you do that. I'm going to decide to do that. And you also feel that there's going to be no comeback. There's going to be no repercussions for what you do. But the ulama, and if I use the word in terms of its literal meaning, the learned people, the people who've spent time to try to understand who Allah is, they've spent years trying to understand who Allah is, they know the power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds over each person. They know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls every moment of your life. He has predetermined it. He could take your soul at the click of a finger. And the fact that when we rest our heads on our pillows, our souls are moved from our bodies. Many people say to me, Musa, what's this deja vu? You know, we get deja vu. Where you look and you think, I'm sure I've experienced something like this before. You just can't put a finger on it. And you can literally, for the next split second, predict what's going to happen. And then it slowly disappears. The deja vu disappears. Deja vu is when your soul was taken out, when you were asleep. Your soul gets taken out. And you, if you're fortunate, you visit the realm of the heavens. And you see the future. You see lots of things. That's what dreams are. You're physically experiencing lots of things going on around you. And then what happens is you wake up in the morning and you can recollect some things you can't recollect because dreams are very quick. Okay, they're very short, very quick, and they can be very abstract. There's lots of things going on at the same time and you get them all mixed up because you keep going out of dream mode and normal mode, dream mode, normal mode as you're sleeping. And then a day, two days, a week later, you see something and you suddenly, oh, this has happened before. In fact, just the yesterday or this morning, I had deja vu. And I thought, this happened before. Somebody did this before. And I was replying back to somebody. And I knew what the next person was going to say. And they said exactly that same thing. Now, how did I get that? That's obviously because I've experienced it in a dream. And when I experienced it in my dream, I could not recollect it when I woke up in the morning because 
unless you break a dream midway, like we do whenever people have a dream and they get up for Fajr, because Fajr is an unnatural waking up in that you've set an alarm for yourself in the middle of the night, which you're normally in dream mode, because by the time we go to sleep is 11, 12 o'clock at night, so you're kind of entering into dream mode in the kind of middle of the night after an hour or two of sleeping. So by about 3, 4, 5, you're in proper deep sleep. So when you get woken up, then you could be woke, uh, 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 you could arise literally whilst you're in a dream. So your soul has been returned back to you at that time. So your, your uh, recollection is very fresh. So you quickly write it down because within half an hour, you're, it's going to go. After you finish Fajr Salah, and then you ask yourself, oh, that dream, what? you can't even remember what the dream was about. It's gone. So unless you write it down immediately when you get up, you will forget it. Otherwise, all the other dreams that you had at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, they're already long gone. And it's only, you know, a week later, two weeks later, you're doing something and then you suddenly deja vu comes to you and you think, oh, hold on, that's happened before. I know they always say it's a glitch in the matrix, but that's not the case. Okay, it's a, you know, deja vu that you've had. It's something that you've recollected from a dream time that you had. So it is the people who know fear. It is the people who are knowledgeable of Allah the power that he possesses. Okay, similarly, for example, if there was a vial, a test tube, which had, you know, the most dangerous gas in it, and it was currently in liquid form, you know, we would be carrying it like this around, you know, probably with cotton wool around it, inside a case, that would be inside another case, and we would, you know, carry it so carefully, wearing full PPE, and you know, breathing masks and whatever. If a baby gets hold of this little test tube, it starts just chucking it around, and you're thinking, "Oh my God, that, you know, what's this baby doing? Is this gonna?" Because he has no knowledge of the danger of that particular substance in its hand. He has no knowledge whatsoever, so he has no fear. He has no fear whatsoever. It is only those who truly recognize the potential of that test tube and what's in it that have fear. So it is only the people who know Allah. To the capacity has allowed them, uh, my clock has disappeared, uh, to the, uh, uh, the party has allowed them, sorry, say again, right? So till, uh, until they fully understand, then the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come in. So we all can develop that. We all don't need to go study a seven, eight year course. That seven, eight year course is for those people who are eventually going to become scholars and that's going to be their day job. Okay, their job is going to be to teach us Quran, teach us Hadith, give us lectures, uh, be there when we need spiritual advice, religious advice. That's going to become their role. For the 99.9% .9 of us, we're not going to become scholars. We're going to have our own regular jobs. But the 99.9% .9 of us also still need to have fear of Allah. Heaven, Jannah is not just for the ulama. Heaven, Jannah, we hope is for everybody. Okay, we want everybody there. So therefore, we have to grow some understanding and appreciation of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in order to develop that fear of Him and also to develop that, the, the power that He holds over our life. And when I say life, I don't mean just the one when our mothers gave birth to us and then when we breathe our last, but also the one which will start when we breathe our last, when we're resurrected and we go upon another journey, including that, that life as well. And that's arguably more important. Well, not arguably, that is more important. Because in this life, even if you live as a pauper, even if you live day to day for food, even if you, your shelter is a cardboard box, eventually you will leave that state. You will not stay in that state for eternity. But the hereafter is something which is for eternity. It's something which you cannot do. Now, even, you know, even if a person is living like that, he could resort to stealing. And if he resorts to stealing, he may change his life by stealing. But in Jannah, or sorry, in the hereafter rather, one has no capacity to do anything. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows his full power, shows his full authority at that particular time. So that's something that we need to uh, bear in mind. Uh, about how we develop this recognition of Allah and how we move forward. So inshallah,
tomorrow uh, our show will continue. It may not be live, but our show will continue. And uh, we will be back with you next week um, for Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. All being well. Uh, it's a bit late now to ring in with your question. And if you are, what have you been doing for the last 40 minutes for crying out loud? Just waiting for the last minute before you call in. So I would suggest you save your questions for next week. Um, then uh, call the regular number and put your questions to me or my colleague uh, on Monday, Tuesday, so that you would get a response. Other than that, uh, I hope that the traffic on the way home has now died down and I would get there in reasonable time. Uh, if not, I'll just leave my car in the car park and walk it home. I probably will get there faster. But then I'd have a problem in the morning because my car wouldn't be outside my house. So I guess I need to think that strategy through a little bit longer uh, rather than just deciding uh, to, uh, for the moment and saving myself. Other than that, I pray that you have a prosperous and good evening as well as a good Friday. We know now that we have entered into Friday after Maghrib of Thursday and we now move on to our Juma. Yani, this is the, as we call it, Jumarat, you know, it's the night of Friday which precedes the day. So make the use, make use of it rather, make the use of it. Send the rood upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Any opportunity you can get, send the rood upon him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our efforts and cleanse us from our sins and raise us with the pious and the prophets, and the truthful ones, and those who do good. Ameen. So on that note, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I will now take leave and give you my salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.